Thank you so much for coming on the show here today. I know you're a busy guy. I really appreciate your time. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm I'm actually a lifelong engineer slash entrepreneur um, right. who kind of backdoored, stumbled into the training, fitness, physical preparation space myself, um, mostly out of... Uh, I was sitting at a desk all day long coding things for people and I I just felt empty with life. And so I kind of, yeah. I found my way into some strength and conditioning slash, you know, high intensity functional fitness type gyms, realized like this old athlete in me that I had abandoned at, in 10th grade, uh, <laughs> come, come itching back probably was like a midlife crisis moment right? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Happened to get laid off from the company. It was MySpace, if you happen to hear of this company. So I was, yes. I was working for MySpace as a coder, got laid off. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go all in on this whole, like, be, you know, being a coach and learning how to open a gym type thing. And that's kind of the evolution of how I got into it. I love it. I love it. Dude, when I saw that you worked for MySpace, I immediately had flashbacks to how much time we would take to, like, create the perfect homepage. Right? Yeah. Like, it was such a big deal to create that. And then, unfortunately... No longer with us, but well, yeah. I mean, for those of us who got to experience it, it was a uh, special moment in the beginnings of the internet. I would say, yeah, uh, yeah, for sure, for sure. Talk to me though. What originally led you to the world of physical preparation? Like, how did you get started in this space? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it was kind of a, I guess, a culmination of a lot of things. I, as I said, I was pretty unhappy with just sitting at a desk eating Italian dinners because because he's. Places would cater dinner and cater lunch because they want you coding all day long. So it's like I'm just drinking <laughs> soda and eating pasta all the time. <laughs> uh, put on like 30 pounds, uh, became single in, in the Los Angeles dating market uh, right in the, in the crux of that. And I'm like, whoa, I probably, you know, if, if I want to, you know, explore dating or not be, a, you know, person coding, <laughs> coding all day, all hours, <laughs> I better uh, take care of myself a little bit. So um, like I mentioned earlier, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur at, by heart. And what entrepreneurs do is they kind of just go for the most extreme things and go all the way in when they find it. So I, like, I remember I found like some push-up challenge, which led me to P90X, which led me to something else, which led me to like CrossFit and strength and conditioning type gyms. And it was like what I had been, I would, the, the mind-blowing moment was like all the stuff I was doing at a 24-hour fitness for all of these years, 30 years, was like so opposite of what was happening in 45 or 60 minutes in these other types of gyms. And I'm like, Hey, sure. I can get behind that. Like 60 minutes, go all the way in and come out on the other side feeling, you know, pretty healthy. I'll do that. And so that was kind of the, the beginning journey of it. Um, like I said, I go all the way in when I start doing stuff. So once I discovered this, I realized like 99% of the world was thinking of fitness the wrong way. So I started thinking of this as like, this was a technology shift. This was like a burgeoning you know, industry that wasn't really out there yet. This was before boutiques really took off. Yeah. And so I was like, I'm going to learn how to become a coach in this space. I'm going to learn everything about it. I'm going to learn the nutrition angle. Um, I had a daughter growing up at the time who was getting into basketball. So it was like, I could see the need for all these basketball girls to learn how to become stronger, fitter, faster, more explosive. And uh, yeah, it's like all those kind of culminating points just cat, you know, catapulted me in one direction. And that was it. Wow. Dude, I mean, like, there's so many things going on there. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, like, okay, so you decide you're going to be a coach. What brings you to where you're at today? Because you're obviously not coaching in the traditional sense, right? You're not on gym floor. Talk to me about your business, how you grew that, or really maybe how you identified this is something the fitness space needs and I'm going to build it. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess in general, like most, and there's probably a lot of people listening to the show who will relate to this, but if you're an entrepreneurially minded, like what got me into this fitness space was like, Oh, there's this huge thing everyone's missing. And so I got into this space in general as a coach and as an, as a advocate for this type of a lifestyle to my community. And then, um, as I got into that, being a lifelong software person, I started looking for the software to run the gym that I was building. And I realized like, Ooh, there's nothing that I, I would really get behind knowing what I could build versus what it what was out there. So um, then I ended up to kind of shifting all my energy towards like, I launched my gym, I got it going, I got my coaches going, I had some great business partners. And then uh, let's work on the software to actually run the gym <laughs> a little bit better than what's available. So yeah, it's, it's really the same mindset and the same thing, just redirected in a different way, depending on what the, the bigger need was. And what I kind of felt was, uh, if, if I was struggling to run a gym using the software that was available, and I'm a software professional, people who weren't software professionals were probably having an even harder time running their gym using the software that was available. So like, we need to try and make this easier so that 
more people can run their gyms more effectively. Right. Right. And that was the, that was the mindset. I love it. I love it. Well, I definitely want to talk business with you here today because you're a business guy, you're an entrepreneur, but to start off, one of the things I'd like to talk about are what you describe as North star metrics, right? What are for starters, North star metrics and why might we prioritize that over other standard metrics like revenue or something of that nature? Well, that's a really good question. So, I mean, a North Star metric, it's, it's really a singular North Star metric is your single and single most important metric in your business. And I think the flaw that has happened naturally is a lot of people put revenue as some aspect of revenue as their North Star metric. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess I should walk this back before I start talking about, you know, where we're going wrong. A North Star metric is the combination of three key traits. <clears throat> it is a metric that expresses customer value which is like probably the biggest one that people miss. It's a metric that um, reflects your current business uh, direction or trajectory or need. And then the third aspect is it's a metric that is a driver or can be manipulated. Mm. So the reason why revenue is bad is it doesn't, customers don't really care about your revenue. First of all, <laughs> sure. it reflects no customer value. And second of all, it's a, it's a result, not a driver. Okay. So a lot of people don't like, it's a nuanced way of thinking, but it's really important. Like you can't just wake up in the morning and say, like, I want to bench 325. You've got to do all the work that gets you to 325. Sure. And it's the same idea with, uh, with, with revenue. You can't just wake up in the morning and say like, Hey, I want to make $80,000 this month. You have to <laughs> do the work and put things in motion that bring you the, bring you the, d- deliver the value that brings the customers that drive the revenue. Right. Gotcha. And so that's why this North Star metric topic is so important because without thinking through it that deeply, a lot of people are just focused on the revenue. And when you're just focused on the revenue, when the revenue becomes your North Star metric, a lot of things can go bad because you're making choices based on what you're focused on. Right. Right. Yeah. And in the absence of an intelligently designed North Star metric, you're going to focus on revenue. And when you focus on revenue, you start making choices that are like, Hey, I'm just going to raise rates. Uh, I'm going to run a special, a group on to get a whole bunch of people in here because I need to make more money. Like, all, you know, all the pretty much if you look back at all the mistakes you probably made in your business, they're all because you thought revenue first. I love it. So, yeah. So would you take this one step further? Would you give us an example? Because like I can understand like the the markers that you're looking for there. But would you give us an example from like a business you've worked yep. with or something yeah, yeah. like that? So let me let me start by giving you examples of companies that we know okay. because uh this will help frame it because no, no matter what industry or niche you're in, it might be tweaked a little bit differently. And me just throwing out gym examples may or may not help. But let's talk about like YouTube. Yeah. Right. YouTube's North Star metric is number of minutes of videos watched. Okay. That's it. Yeah. Just number of minutes of videos watched. Okay. Um, so, and, and Airbnb, number of nights hosts can sell or number of nights stayed in hosts. Okay. Right. So you can see these are, these are actually value driven metrics. Like if our videos are good and there's a lot of them and they're easy to find and there's all these things line up, we're going to have more minutes of videos watched. If our hosts are solid and the properties are solid and the hosts know how to run a good business and blah, 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 blah. More people will stay at Airbnbs instead of hotels more often though, th- thus more nights stayed. Mm. Okay. So in the gym industry, I'll throw a couple out there that, that can fit this marker. It could be a n- uh, number of pounds lost. If you're a weight loss type, uh, clinic or whatever. It could be number of, this would be a tough one, but I'm just gonna throw it out there because it's easy to imagine. Number of D1 athletes delivered. Yeah. Right. That would be hard because your metric will inherently will be low. Yeah. But it could be, uh, you know, if you want to make that a little bit easier, number of uh, D1 interviews that you can get or, you know, something to that degree, because then you're put, because that's what the customer wants. If you're a, like youth sports, athletic training for, you know, to get people into college sports, you, like what you don't want is you don't want a North star metric that you're hiding from your customer. Mm. So if I'm like, Hey, my North star metric is like how much money per month I make per customer. If I <laughs> want to join your gym, I'm like, dude, what, what? Like, so you're just telling me you want to take as much money from me as you can. Like, let's talk yeah. about what you're going to give me. So yeah, if, if I was a D one sports training facility, I'll be like, my North star metric is how many kids I place into D one schools or, you know, D whatever schools. And here's, here's, here's the number I'm at right now. I've got five more I'm working on. This should go plus five by next year. And like, this is where we're going. If I hear that as a customer, I'm like, sign my kid up. Like you're focused, you know? Yeah, no, I love that, man. So 
I just had this discussion the other day, but anyone in the fitness industry that made it through COVID has my immediate respect because that was an awful time for everyone except for maybe the in-home fitness, right? Pelotons and people of that nature. So talk to me about how your company, Push Press, made it through that time, especially when so many of the gyms across the country were either closed or getting closed down. Correct. Yeah. It was a tough time. And before I dive into that, I'll, I'll say um, I think most entrepreneurs probably know this, with, but it might need. To, I think it needs to be said. Going through adversity is so important to building a business because if you have nothing but tailwinds, like business is an ebbing and flowing of like hard times and good times. And if you've only known good times and you don't know what the bad times look like, it is impossible to have just the conviction of what you're like. You think you're going, yeah. you're doing good, and you don't even understand what's about to hit you. So, for everyone who made it through, hey, great for you. Um, as far as push press goes. It was actually pretty easy for us. One, we got lucky and we could talk about the topic of luck if you want, because I don't believe in pure luck, but we got in, we got involved in a kind of what I call uh, strategically designed luck. Um, and also we leaned into our mission. And so, and, and so both of those are, are completely like not lucky, but also because we were positioned the way we were, it worked. The lucky end of it we had launched a free version of push press in November for black Friday of 2019. Okay. So we were the only system gym management software system out there that said, Hey, you know what? We support all gyms, big and small. We want to support the small gyms who are overlooked by all these other competitors who feel like who, who aren't getting the support they need. We have a free version. You can use it for free. You can blah, blah, blah. We did that because our mission as an ex gym owner and a team of ex gym owners is we really want to support gym owners. We, right. and, and if you go back to the North Star metric thing, and we weren't even at the point of understanding North Star metrics at this point, but we weren't focused on revenue. We were focused on customer, right? Like there is a whole range of gyms that are making less than $10,000 a month who can't use software because spending $300 a month on software is stupid when you make $3,000 right. a month, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's like, well, they need support too. So let's find a way to do that. And we did it. Well, did we know COVID was going to happen? No. <laughs> but when you're going into COVID and everyone's thinking about saving money or members are quitting and I need to, I know my business is going to make it, but I need to downsize to a point where I can allow it to make it free became a really attractive option for a lot of gyms. Sure. Right. So that's what I call like strategically designed luck. Like that wasn't just us having to be there and a hundred dollar bill blew by us. It was like, we, we strategically did something because we saw a problem. That problem became magnified because of COVID and it helped us personally. Right. Yeah. Um, the other side, leaning into the customer pain point is, I don't know if you, if you recall, like it was chaos when COVID hit yeah. and it was like, can I get a PPP loan? How do I do this EIDL thing? Like, do I need to shut down like masks are okay? Masks are not okay. Cops are coming. Co like, what do I do? <laughs> it was just chaos. Yeah. And um, what we did is we just leaned into that and we said, I'm going to bring on a banker. He's going to talk about all the things you need to do to set up your finances to get PPP. We're going to do a webinar three times a week. Boom. Free resource for all gym owners. Just come and watch it. Figure out how to save your gym. Same thing with the IDL. Same thing with like dealing with the cops. Same thing with landlords, how to pay your rent. Like there were just a million topics that came out of nowhere that yeah. we had to become experts in. Right. So that's in the end, this is a really oversimplification of business, but like if you, if you are obsessed with your customers' pains, things in the long run will work out. Like you might not sell all the customers you want to this month, but as long as you can play the long game and you are just obsessed over the customer that you're serving, it will always, always work out. You just got to stay alive. So I think one of the things that's really interesting is that I often talk about, if you want to market to people, you can either market with money or you can market with time, right? And, and that's essentially what you were doing I mean, I'm sure you knew this at some level, but in, like you said, investing in your clients and their pain points, you're investing time and energy into helping them maintain their business. So then imagine the level of reciprocity you're going to get on the back end of this, right? Because yep. look, like, let's just be honest. I don't know what the number was. Maybe it was 25%, 30%. A certain chunk of those businesses went away and they will never come back. But the ones that did stay and that you helped stay open man, I can only imagine the level of loyalty they would have to you and your business for doing that. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, customer satisfaction and the things that come out of that are, and, and again, this is just from my experience being a gym, gym owner. Like we don't have enough money to go out and just like splatter the whole, can't put up billboards, can't do a lot of things that other businesses can do. So it's like, just make sure your customers are achieving the goals that they need to achieve and that they recognize it and that they're, you know, happy and they're, 
you know, they come into your business and they leave happier every day. And like, you're going to get referrals, yeah. especially if you know how to ask for them or you know how to create the moments that the referrals organically are created. That's another end of the equation is like engineering a lot of these experiences that you want the outcomes against. But um, yeah, for sure. Like we, we have done very well in our, I mean, we've been around for a decade and probably yeah. not, not a lot of people have heard of us. But within the, the small, like you, you create what I call like clusters. And it's like, if I land, if I landed you as a customer on push press and you loved us and, and we did everything for you, then it's like the eight, eight gyms around you that you talk to are eventually going to hear about us from you. And for then sure. it just goes and it goes and it goes. And that's how you build a scalable like growth model. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Well, and you know, as well as I do, like those are the most sustainable businesses as well. Like the ones that are just throwing money at people and there's massive amounts of churn in their business like those aren't very strong steady businesses versus the people that you have really just taken amazing care of you've had that organic growth you built by a you know referrals and great customer service yes. those are the ones that really stick and that really last over the years correct yep i'm i'm a very big proponent of um, putting a human face to your business and being a human with your customers, which is easy for gyms to do because that's kind of what you do. Right. Um, it's a little like for software companies, it's like most of my competitors or most people in the software industry miss that. Like there is no face sure. to the business. Like you, if, in fact, if you think of the most successful businesses that are in Silicon Valley or in the world, they all have a face. Yeah. They all have I was a just human thinking about that. Right. Like yeah. Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, um, actually the Google guys are a little bit obfuscated, but the, in the tech yeah. world, they're known, uh, yeah. you know, Larry Page and Ellison and them, but they all have a face and they all have someone like, I mean, even Trump to some degree, yeah. right? Not even to yeah. some degree, to a long, a big degree. Like there people are attracted to human beings. They're not attracted to businesses. So it's like your gym, as great as the thing it's doing, your coaches and, or the owners are going to be the ones who the the members are going to be attracted to relate with and not quit over or quit yeah. over depending on what happens right <laughs> but they might quit over them too for sure yeah for sure okay so i hate to be the bearer of bad news but it does feel like the small boutique gyms that you came up in that i've owned for like 15 years now it's getting harder and harder for those to survive right we've got like the big box commercials we've got the <laughs> fitness franchises but i know this is something that you're really passionate about why are you such an advocate for like small gym owners as a whole? Uh, okay. So this is an interesting topic, which I haven't talked about enough lately. When I moved to, I, I live in Las Vegas now. I moved from Los Angeles. Um, I was, you know, one of the people that the Nevadans say, don't California, my Nevada. And I was one of them. But uh, <laughs> so I moved here and what I realized, I never thought of it this way, but what I realized when I was here is like anything I didn't care about because moving, I had to like, I had to reset up everything. Right. But every, right. anything I didn't care about, I went to a retail big box, Home Depot, Lowe's, whatever, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Anything I did care about, I looked for a local boutique, single owner operator, person who was fanatical about the thing that they did, right? So mm, I care about yeah. my fitness. So I found a boutique gym. I care about coffee. I found all the little boutique coffee roasters in my area. Yes. And, and that was the, the light bulb moment for me was like, I don't think I'm unique. You know, like anyone who really cares about something will search out the very, very good version of it. And for all the other things you don't care about, you go to the whatever version. The reason I'm so bullish on boutique gyms is everybody needs fitness. And I think everybody's being, or not everybody, probably 85 to 90% for 90 of people are being failed by big box fitness because it's self-service. That's the only way they can make that model work. So right. easily eight to 10, eight to nine out, nine out of 10 people that go to a big box gym aren't getting better aren't getting their goals met, you know, don't have the, don't have the drive to show up when they don't want to. There's a lot of things to that, that are making it fail. And so if we can figure out a way to get that message out to all of those people, like the boutique gyms would be overrun. There needs, there would yeah. be, need to be 10 times more to be honest. Yeah. Um, and the cool thing with boutique gyms is too, is they dive into specialty stuff, MMA, CrossFit, you know, strength and conditioning, D1 training, yoga. Like there's so many different ways you can move your body and express, you know, your body in a cool way that like I've done all of them, you know, yeah. and they're all interesting. Yeah. So you get no, none of I, that at a big box. Dude, I absolutely love that. And man, it just has my brain pinging about all, like you said, the specialty things that I enjoy in life, right? Like if I want a massage, I don't go to Massage Envy or a big franchise, right? I go to the gal that I know that, 
works on the Colts and all the other professional athletes. If I want coffee, I don't go to Starbucks. Well, I do out of convenience. But if I want a really good <laughs> cup of coffee, I go to our local spot, the well or something like that. I mean, like you alluded to, these are the people that are like fanatical about the quality of the <laughs> service. They're like you, right? Because I think that's ultimately we, what we want, right? Is other fanatical people to like bounce our ideas off of and to associate ourselves with. But dude, that is so yeah. true because like you said, My if it's... Okay. If it's something you commoditize, whatever, that's fine. But if you want something like unique or special, you go to a specialty yeah. service. And and honestly, the beauty of it is like not everyone needs coffee. Not everyone yeah. needs massages. Everyone yeah. needs their own health and wellness. Everybody. Yes. Right. Yep. Not everyone's going to value it, but everyone <clears throat> needs it. And to kind of like dial into your point today, like I had a, I went to my coffee shop today um, and the dude literally had a three minute conversation with me about how he changed cups because if the first version of the cup he's using was dripping for, you know, like he went over this yeah. whole thing and I'm like, dude, like you're so into this. Like he wanted to talk to me about the <laughs> cup change that he made, like how important it was to his coffee experience. And I'm like, I love it. Let's go. I love it. Okay. So now I got to ask, what was the coffee choice of the day today? What are you oh, drinking? I always just go black drip. Black drip. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Light roast black drip. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so you like the caffeine, the light roast is, uh, you know what I like, I like coffee that tastes more like tea. Like, I don't ah, like tasting okay. the burnt taste. I don't like tasting, like, light roast tastes a little more flowery to me. That's what I like. Yeah. Okay. I like it. Okay. All right. What I'd love to hear next, were there any key moments in your journey where you really felt like things were falling into place? Because obviously, you don't go from literally startup to a $100 million business overnight. So what do you feel were some key moments or steps in your growth? Oh, that's a hard question. I can tell you this much. Every stage along the way, I felt like things were really working for us. And also there were so many big things we had to change that it was questionable. <laughs> right. Yeah, when Before we jumped on the actual recording, I was telling you like, hey, uh, how, you asked me how today was going. And I'm like, well, there's just as, n the same number of fires burning today as yesterday. And none of them are any more intense. So that's a pretty good day. <laughs> uh, yeah, like that. It, it's a hard question for you to answer because I think human nature dictates that we focus on the things we need to fix as opposed to the things that are going right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and probably True. a weakness of mine is I don't acknowledge enough the things that are going right to enough people. That's not right. to say I harp on the things that are going bad, but I'm just like, hey, let's get up. We got these things to fix. Let's do it. Let's focus on these five things. Let's go. I mean, we've done a lot of things right, honestly. And I think, uh, I think the number one marker of our success is we, I feel like we've, we've entered an industry where nobody cared about the customer and we did. And so it yeah. was like, that was the number one thing we did right that we just leaned into and kept doing. And it just, all of the decisions we made along the way and all the things that we tried and experimented with were all in the light of how do, does this help a gym owner? You know, um, whereas I feel like we we're competing with a lot of people who are like, how does this help our shareholders first? And that's, right. that's, you know, my whole North Star metric is they're just operating backwards. Yeah. And I think it's okay in a vacuum, but the minute we came on the scene and now there's a couple other smaller like startup software companies that are kind of in our same vein and yeah. also proliferate, you know, honestly, this is a trend that I'm seeing across all verticals, like shipping software, haircutting software, salons, like uh, everyone. There is somebody who came up out of the space like me who realized that the company didn't care about them, who built the software, who leaned into being customer centric and is starting to win the market. And it's, it's, uh, it is proliferating. I'm seeing across all small business verticals. Yeah. So now I'm curious, was there like one moment when you were using whatever software you were using at the time where you're just like, I just, I can't do this anymore. This yeah. is absolute trash. It's driving me insane. I have to do something on my own. That's a great question. I actually refer to this as my foam roller story. Okay. So, um, <laughs> it, this is when I was completely buying into like functional fitness training and yep. anything that the gym owner would tell me to do, I would do like, Oh, you want to buy those neat knee sleeves for lifting. Okay. Bottom. You want to buy these shoes? Bottom. You want to, you know, like right. glove, whatever <laughs> I bought them all. And, uh, so he sends out an email and he's like, Hey, um, you guys should all be doing myofascial, you know, work at home. We have these foam rollers that you can just pre-order and buy, and then I'll give them to you and you can take them home. Blah, blah. I'm like, cool. I'm in. And, he, and there's a link in the email. I'm like, Click on the link. And, um, I won't say that, you know, I won't say the company name, whatever it's regardless, but like, I went through this process of like, do I have an account? Do I not have an account? I think I have an account. Oh, it might be linked to my Facebook. No, it wasn't trying to reset my password. Oh, I don't have an account. 
20 minutes of like spinning through yeah. the uh, get get an account. Yeah. And eventually, because, and again, I'm bu super biased and super impatient because I'm a software developer. So I was like, no, <laughs> not doing this. And I got in the car <laughs> and I drove across town. And this is, you know, 2008. And it was a little bit more like boutiques weren't everywhere. So it was like my gym was 15 minutes across LA, which right. is a major investment for me. Uh, I drove over there. I threw the $20 bill, like wadded it up, threw it at him. Because <laughs> I was literally pissed off. I had to drive over there, but I wanted the foam roller. Right. And I was like, yo, here's your 20 bucks. Just give me my damn foam roller. I'm so pissed off. I'm going to go home now. You know, just, I was just like mad right. at him for the software experience I had. Uh, that from that moment forward, I'm like, and, and, you know, this company was one of the biggest or bigger companies in the world of, you know, doing the thing. And I was like, I started looking into it and I'm like, oh man, if this is like the best, biggest company, there's a big gap that can be, can be crossed. So, uh, I, I naively thought it would be easy to cross. And I started to cross that gap. I say naively because it's, I'm 10 years into it. I'm not even anywhere close to being done. So, right. Right. No, I love that though. And I, I think that's the, uh, the approach most entrepreneurs have, right? It's like the problem is so massive. Like you just can't leave it untouched. Right. And you jump in full expecting like, Hey, maybe, maybe it's going to take a while. And like you alluded to for you, you're 10 years in now. It's taken probably longer than you would have thought, but it's like that finish line is what continues to drive you forward, right? Because you're like, I can't leave this as is. I got to keep getting better. Correct. Yeah. It's it's really like, I think through like gym owners, gym owners specifically, but all small business owners broadly deserve the same tools that Fortune 100 companies get. And we're in a day and age where they can't, they should and can be able to get them. And so that is my mission. Like I won't stop until a gym owner can run their business with the same insight and efficiency that a fortune 100 company can. That's awesome. I love it. Okay. So a little bit off the beaten path here, you guys have seen a lot of growth. You've been at this 10 years. I'm assuming you've added some levels of complexity uh, along the way, just by virtue <laughs> of the fact that you're growing as a result, how has your leadership had to change or evolve as your business has grown? That's another really good question. You're pretty insightful. Good question. Ah, I'm trying, man. If only someone would have asked me some of these questions five years ago. Um, <laughs> me personally or the leadership team? I could definitely talk uh, to me personally. because let's, you know, let's talk about you. Yeah. Um, How have you had to change your leadership approach yeah. or style? Okay. So being a bootstrap company, meaning like we did it all ourselves. And every time we sold another client, we were able to spend more money in another direction. Like our clients were our investors. Means you do everything. So... This is just like owning a gym. So when I owned a gym, I did the marketing, I did the sales, I did the janitorial work, I coached, I wrote the programming, I did everything. And so in the early days of, of push press, I did everything. I wrote the code, I did the sales, I was customer support, blah, blah, blah. And as you start to grow and hire to, to buy back your time so you can start working on the business more, it's uh, you're used to doing everything. And the w weird thing for me that I didn't get, because I just see myself as another guy, is mm -hmm. the, the CEO slash founder, when he comes into a room and says something, people are like, uh-oh, throw away everything we just talked about for the last three months because the, the CEO just <laughs> said something. So let's not do that, right? And I don't know everything everyone's talking about. So it's like, I just blow right. things up. I walk into a room and just blow it up. Um, <laughs> so the biggest thing, like in the most recent past I had to do was shut up. You know, mm. like have a trusted circle. And and before I never understood why CEOs don't really like hang out with the people. And now I'm getting it more because you just go to lunch with someone. And you're like, oh, you know, maybe we should uh, change this thing to this. And the next thing you know, it's like a, a, a leader's coming back to me. Like, why did you just blow up our entire roadmap? Because like we were working on this thing. And now because you said this, they've just thrown it all away, you know? <laughs> yeah. So that's a big one. Also, because I was used to doing everything. It's just it, there's a weird moment where you don't do it anymore. So like I used to do all customer support and we did all customer support through Slack and on the phones and Slack or not Slack intercom. Mm -hmm. And then at one point they just like disabled my intercom account. So I couldn't log in anymore. And it's just like, I need to see how <laughs> many people are commenting in. Like, do you guys got it? You know, and, and there's some level of trust there and trust in yourself and separating is all this weird stuff. But like the more and more things that get taken away from you, eventually there was a point where like literally almost everything had been taken away from me, probably for the, you know, the good of company. And right. I was just like, there was a period of time for like a month. I'm like, I, I don't even know what to do. Like, I'm just scheduling meeting and talking to people. Cause like, what else am I going to do all day long? Um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, and it took me a while to settle into like, now my role is to 
really think about the vision and think about the direction and make sure there's alignment and culture set and, and resources are secured for the growth of the company and, you know, like growing my leaders to become bigger leaders. And like, there's just a different, completely different trajectory of what I have to do now than even two years ago. That was a, a really awkward, like I went from like being a nine years old to 13 year old years old, you know, like yeah. really awkward moment there. Yeah. So, okay. So a follow up to that. How did you go about cultivating that trust? Because I think that's really easy to say, oh, yeah, just trust people more. Right. But I think all great leaders have to go through this phase. So what did you do or was there a moment where you're like, no, I just have to let these people do the work? I think um, it's a very cliche thing to say. We have to trust or we have to build trust or sure. you know, whatever, like you've alluded to. I had to do a lot of very intentional work. And I think this is where like when, when that month came where I was like, I don't know what to do anymore. I started uh, I, I found an advisor or two who have like been pretty deep in the software building space. And they've identified some of these problems in me, like, oh, you're, you're getting too involved. You don't, you really don't trust people. I'm like, what are you talking about? I trust people. And they're like, no, when you go in and you say like this thing, that's you not trusting them. You just are being low key about it. Right. Like, mm. um, so <clears throat> the first thing I did was read a book called, uh, the five dysfunctions of, oh, geez, five, five dysfunction dysfunctions of a team. Is of a that team. it? Yeah. By yeah. Lencioni. Yeah. That was the first thing I read. And that opened my eyes to the fact that like, oh, wow, I really don't trust as much as I think I trust, like the things I'm doing are exhibiting mistrust. So whether I trust or I don't trust, it's like, uh, it doesn't matter, you know? Right. Um, and then, you know, it's like you, you kind of dive deeper and deeper into, I started thinking about communication, like the way I say things, the, like a one word change in the way I say things can completely change it, how it's received, the feelings that are behind it, like just all this stuff, right? Am I leading people to answers? Am I being disingenuous about it? Or am I really trying to get someone to grow? Like, it's real easy to say like, hey, why don't you think about it this way? And it could be a leading leading question to being like, hey, you're stupid. Why don't you think about it this way? Or it could be like, <laughs> why don't you think about it this way? Which is really genuinely like, let's explore this. Or maybe you should explore this and grow in that in that direction and come back to me and tell me. The, the, the nuance of communication was another thing I had to start studying, which I'm not even close to being great at yet. It's, it's a communication is a tough one. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Okay. So there's actually Last a book I'm reading least. right now. That's a, a pretty oh, yeah. awesome one, which I can't fully endorse yet, but it's called turn the ship around. Okay. It's a, uh, it's written by a nuclear submarine guy, nuclear submarine captain. I hope I didn't butcher that. Uh, there's right. a lot of roles being thrown around there, but it's a, it, he exposes the concept of leaders, building systems that create leaders, mm. which, uh, okay. you know, the, the common military thing before he got into it, he said was like, leaders have subordinates, subordinates follow rules. And he's like, I'm gonna change that. I want you to think for yourself and you to understand what you have to do. And I trust you. And that's yeah. a pretty cool direction. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Last but not least, yep. this one may be tough too, but how have you as a human being had to change and evolve to get to where you're at? Oh, good one, man. You got a lot of good ones. Um, okay. So I've always considered myself to be, uh, I don't know exactly what the term is, but like the messy genius, the person who can think of all these crazy ideas, but like, can't clean their desk, doesn't make their bed. You know, like I was plagued <laughs> yeah. by losing my wallet or my AirPods my whole life. Like that, that's just me. And the reality, when I think about it, it's because my head is so much in space all the time where I'm like dreaming about something or I, I like, I told my wife all the time, like I just blacked out. Like, I started mm. thinking about what we could change in the business or this thing. And then like, next thing I knew I was over here washing dishes and I don't know what happened between here yes. and here, you know? Yeah. No, that's my work in progress right now. I would show you my desk. It's still a mess somewhat It's better <laughs> than before, but it's not where I want it to be. But I've, I've actually started like to be, to grow a company to the level that I wanted to get it to. I have to become operationally better. And part of being operationally better is processes and definitions and clarity and all of the opposite things, in my opinion, of being this wild eyed, you know, visionary who just thinks, t you know, five year solutions out, out in the future. Um, so right. for me personally, it's a lot of, yeah, I want to controlling myself. Like I want to just go over here and daydream about this thing, but I should put my shoes away first, you know, or I should make my bed <laughs> right. before I just start getting up and writing this thing I want to write. Um, and so th that's the current trajectory I'm on right now. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, I think one of the hardest things, and granted, I don't run a business at the level that you do, but whether it's having a vision for your business or, you know, I'll get on these thoughts about, oh man, this person that has knee pain and next thing I know, 
you know, my daughter's talking to me or my son. I'm like, I don't know what say that saying. again. <laughs> Repeat that for me. Yeah, please. exactly. Exactly. So it's that ability to like kind of disconnect too, and like, hey, there's these defined times where I am going to brainstorm and strategize. And there's other moments where I need to be able to <laughs> compartmentalize and put that away and be in the moment. And I think that's one of the hardest parts about, again, I feel like our brains work probably pretty similarly. Yeah. You just think on a, a, a longer term scale, but being able to differentiate between the, the daydreaming and the brainstorming and the critical thinking and the being here in the moment, if you can kind of differentiate those two and compartmentalize those two, infinitely life is better. Yep. I agree. And I think in the big picture, a lot of it's about bringing the people on who are just naturally better than you in certain things. Um, yes. And so, you know, like uh, some of the people on my leadership team are very, very operationally organized and, and mm -hmm. them and I work together very well because it's just like, they'll keep me in line. I'll keep them thinking big, you know, like we kind of work together really well, but at the same time, like, yes, what I think one of the biggest things push press needs is probably a COO. Like someone who's just like the internal CEO, who's just focused on like organization, operations, everything. We just can't afford, we're not at the stage where we can really justify having that. So it's like, I've got to step up and do better. And, and right. some other people have to kind of like also dance around that area. But, um, you know, eventually that can probably be solved. Yeah, so. absolutely. Okay, man, big question time. <laughs> if you could alter the space-time continuum, and give young Dan Uemura one piece of advice, what would it be? Uh, oof. If it's self-serving, man, it's so hard. Like, you know what? I'm, I'm happy enough with my life. Like it, it yeah. could be something as dumb as like, hey, just uh, believe in compounding interest a little bit more when you're 20, probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause you know, you immediately start thinking like, Oh, I probably should have not gone to UCLA and stayed in the Bay area because I would have been an entrepreneur right when the internet popped and my whole life would have changed, but then I wouldn't have met my wife and like my kids wouldn't be in existence. And like you play the sliding right. doors thing. And I'm like, I don't actually don't want yes. that. Uh, yep. so yeah, m maybe, um, being a little bit more, I don't know how to put this in it. I basically never felt the repercussions of any of my, any one of my actions. And I became increasing, increasing, increasingly more risky as I grew older, like yeah. shut that down. And at 24, like just stop. <laughs> if I could, if I could right. actually convince myself to do that, like let's just put right. some money in a bank account, invest in the stock market, do the smart things, be a little bit more like, you know, I took a lot of long shots when I was young, which got me nowhere for a long time. Right. And I think I, 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 I could have been a little bit more, Probably maybe it goes to the operational thing. Like I could have made my bed when I was eight years old, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. Yep. I love it. Okay. Last but not least, we got our lightning round. So four fairly short questions, but your answers can be as long or short as you like. <clears throat> All right. Number one, talk to me about pacing your friend for that hundred miler a few weeks back. How was that for you? I didn't have to run the whole hundred. So let me clarify that yes. because if that okay. would mean I just did the hundred miler, I just paced him for 20. Yes. Okay. Um, I did not prep enough. But I also have done uh, 50Ks, which is 31 miles or yeah, I think 31 miles. Yeah, 31, 32. Uh, so I knew I could do it. Um, I didn't prep yeah. enough, so that was stupid. But it was uh, it was a great, I mean, I love it. That that one race in particular, I love. I'll, I'll pace anybody, whoever does it, that asks me. Uh, it's called the Javelina 100. And it's uh, five 20-mile loops kind of through the Arizona desert. Okay. And you only get a pacer at night. <clears throat> so it's like... oh. It's actually amazing running through the desert at night and we had a full moon. So it was like pretty oh. spiritual of a, of a day of a night. I love it. Absolutely. What was the temperature like when you uh, did that? It's probably in the fifties. I mean, you're moving. Oh. So I didn't even, I was wearing a t-shirt and shorts. Like I wasn't even cold. Yeah. You um, probably felt great. No, it was perfect. Honestly, Everything about it was yeah. perfect. Yeah. Okay. Number two, best selling tip for trainers and coaches who don't think of themselves as salespeople. Oh God, we can do a whole episode on this. I know we can. Uh, <laughs> so I wanted to ask. Well, the, I mean, the best selling tip is you are right. So the bottom line is like, yeah. uh, if you want to make your entire life easier, I don't care if it's dating in the gym or whatever, getting a job, you are a salesperson and that's not bad. I think yes. we, Automat we've seen too many movies and too much stuff in media that says salespeople are bad because they've always been portrayed as bad people. And we experience it in real life. The person who's trying to sell you something you don't need. 
you in this space sell something everyone needs. Just tell yourself that a yeah. hundred times. So as long as you're not doing unscrupulous stuff, you're good. And the way I think you should think of yourself is you are a information collector and disseminator to help somebody make a decision on something that's going to improve their life if they buy in. Yeah. Right. If yeah. as long, again, if, if you're selling fake supplements or just something that's not, you're just trying to extract money. Like it just always goes back to this. Are you trying to take money or give value? If you, what you're giving, you truly believe is value. You're doing a disservice to that person by not letting them make the proper decision with the right information. Yeah. If, and, 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 if, and if you don't give them enough information and they go like, this is not for me, they're probably going to be worse off. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So Dude, that's a great distinction though. Taking money versus giving value. Yeah. I mean, that's it right there. Like that really clearly defines what, you know, like the people that are in it for the right reasons and doing the right things are in it for versus like you said, the people that are just there to extract money yeah. from people. The hard part is a lot of us get into fitness because we love people and we love helping people. And it feels shitty going like, can I swear? I don't know if I can swear. But yes. Yes. You're okay. fine. It feels, <laughs> feels terrible feeling like the person you see on TV who's selling some weird thing to some person and being pushy about it and doing all these things. The best tip I got from someone, because I actually took a sales course that changed my mind on this was like, anything you think a normal salesperson would do, just do the opposite. Have, have mm -hmm. the intention of trying to bring this person into your world and help them, but do the opposite, right? If a salesperson's pushy, don't be pushy. If the salesperson is trying to make you say yes, just stay on the, he calls it stay on the no, right? Uh, I don't know, Mike, I don't know if I'm the best gym for you. Let me ask you a few questions and see if, if we can actually help you, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. you act look, the minute I'm in a sales conversation with you and I tell you like, I'm not sure if push press is the right bit software for you. Let me actually ask you a few questions and see, I don't really know PT. If you're really PT heavy, I'm not sure. Like, let's talk about that a little bit more. It's going to naturally make you want to use push press, to be honest. Like that's, it's a weird yes. human inclination. Yeah. yeah. You you push them away and then they're more attracted to you. Right. Ultimately. Yeah. yeah. But you're not doing it in a, in a rude way. You're just like, I'm looking out for no. you here. Like, let me just ask a few questions because you might not be the best. You're not, this might not be best for you, you know? Yeah. Well, and you know, as well as I do too, when the relationship starts like that, ultimately there's more trust right from the get go. That's the whole point. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You do the opposite of a salesperson because the, they, they start with zero trust. They start with negative trust. But yeah, the minute you start yeah. showing them signals that like, I'm not going to do you like what you're expecting, the trust starts coming real quick, right? And then yeah. you can actually have a real conversation about, and again, if you're selling something that actually works and you believe in what you do and you're not being shitty about it, like you can actually get information from them that allows you to say like, oh, I can help you in this way, but you've got to buy in. You're going to do personal training. We're going to set some goals. We're going to do this. You're going to show up three times a week. And this is what I can, pr I can guarantee you I'm going to do for you. If you show up, you got a guarantee for me. And then this is all going to work. And then the customer's like, okay, let's do it. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I dude, I love that. Okay. For someone who's listening and wants to open a gym, what's the best piece of advice you can give them? Spend, spend a solid amount of, okay, go take a sales course first. And foremost, yep. right? Like yeah. The, yep. being able to close somebody <laughs> into your world. And again, the word, word close even feels dirty saying it, but e being able to express the value that your gym delivers, being able to, let's think of it this way. As a sales professional selling fitness, part of it is just protecting your time. Like you need to know who's coming around that's wasting your time, that's kicking tires, asking dumb yep. questions, who doesn't even belong in your gym, right? Yep. So it's like, there's some of that too, but take a sales course, Figure out a way, and I know this is difficult, and I haven't really, I like to think in models. And I haven't figured out a model for this yet, but <clears throat> every day you should be spending some amount of time working on a bigger picture thing in your business. So it's really easy to get caught up and be like, I got a coach, I got a program, I got to clean toilets, I got to do this, this, this. But it's like 30 minutes, read a book, 30 minutes, you know, talk to someone who's built a big, bigger business than you have, 30 minutes think about like what next year's marketing message could be, right? Like think about the future a little yeah. bit, just 30 minutes a day. And it will, it will probably change quite a bit of trajectory of your business. Dude, that, I mean, you've, you dropped some serious bombs on us, but the non urgent, but important, right? Yeah. Have you ever seen oh, that, yeah, that diagram two two. urgency and importancy? Yes. Yep. Not urgent, but important. And that's the stuff that's the easiest to just kick down the, the curb. You just right? built my mind. Oh, it doesn't matter. Thank you. That's the model. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. We all work yeah. on like, we uh, honestly, in gyms, we work on the urgent important and the yes. not important urgent, right? Like the stupid yes. member problem who's like, you know, oh, some cancer problems going on, you know, like just 
something dumb. What we don't yep. work on is the urgent, not important enough. Yep. And I think and it's, I'm it's, telling... it's as literally as easy as just saying, hey, I'm going to wake up at 7 a.m. and I, I, I have to get my day going by 8. And from 7 to 7.30, while I'm eating my breakfast, I'm going to do, the, I'm going to think of something bigger than today. You know? Yes. Yes. Wow. That's awesome, man. Okay. Last but not least, what's next for Dan Uemura? The same, you know, I used to have all these big dreams of like starting multiple businesses and being some Elon Musky type guy. And I've yeah. come to realize like this job is so big that I will be doing this. Probably this will be my only job. My only, I, yeah. I will, I don't want to say die doing this, but I will retire. <laughs> I will retire doing this. So, uh, yeah. you know, just continually learning to be a better leader, continue, continuing to learn to, you know, grow a significant business to provide value to the world and, um, bring up those around me with me. That's it. I love it. Yeah. I love it, man. Well, Dan, this has been great. I know you're super busy. I appreciate your time. Where can my listeners find out more about you, Push Press, all the great stuff you're doing? Yeah, so Push Press obviously is pushpress.com. Um, one word, obviously, on the on the internet, everything's one word. But if I had a dollar for every time someone put a space in between Push and Press, I would be retired. <laughs> uh, uh, that's just my personal rant. Um, yeah. And then uh, for me personally, like if you want to learn more about me, follow me on social media, all that kind of stuff, because I'm kind of dropping these rants or things daily. Uh, yes. Pushpress.com slash Dan. will have like kind of all the links to like the things I'm working on, my, my thought projects, the things I'm writing, social media, stuff like that. Perfect. Yeah. And I've got all the links that you'd sent over before. So I will get all of that in the show notes. But again, Dan, this is amazing, man. Thank you so much for your time. I really thank you. It. Super fun. That was a good one.